Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be able to come to share with you again uh, this morning. Uh, excuse me that I have to keep my mask on because I am still recovering from the flu and I don't want to spread on to anyone else. Uh, so if my voice is a bit soft, uh, just bear with me. Uh, before we start, let's have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, our beloved Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, Lord, we rejoice to be in your presence. We do thank you, Lord, that you are the Almighty God of creation. willing to pay the most precious price to redeem us unto thyself, and willing to share with us your life of glory. So we want to thank you and praise you at this moment. Lord, we can even gather together to read the Bible, to read your word, and let you speak to our hearts, because, Lord, only your word that is settled in heaven and abides forever. And, Lord, everything else in this world will change, but you change us not. I want to thank you, Lord, that this morning as we come together, constantly, Lord, continually you're helping your people and helping them to draw near to you, and helping them to come to understand your will and your purpose for their life. So we pray that this morning, as we study this chapter together, that also we may receive the same benefit, the same blessing from heaven, that the Holy Spirit will teach us and instruct us and help us to receive, Lord, the blessing from heaven and also a blessed blessing into our lives. So as we come to commit ourselves in this time into thy hand, in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, if you have been with us, it's been a long journey. Um, it's a long journey for near, Nehemiah uh, to journey all the way from Shushan all the way to Jerusalem. He spent a long time there, and it was a long journey for him because he was given a task, almost an impossible task, uh, to lead the people in rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem. And we've seen that through all the other chapters, all the challenges that they face, all the problems that come at them. And when they start the building of the wall, how the enemy, you know, come to scare them and come to threaten them, you know, and how that they, as they put their hands to the work, they were threatening them or coming to attack them, and that may, they may lose their life. But through all that, they stay together. They continue working next to one another, and in 52 days, they rebuilt the wall. And we can see that outwardly, they achieve a great task, right? Rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem is not a small task. It's a tremendous task. Even this day of age, it would take us a lot of labor and equipment in order to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. But in those days, they don't have the machineries, but yet they have to duck out of all the rubble and then restore them into the wall and even hang the gates. Now, one thing is to see the recovery outwardly, but the other thing I hope that you also can see is the recovery inwardly. Before... Nehemiah came to Jerusalem, the people of Israel was pretty much downcast. They were in despair. They were all kind of dispersed, right? Everyone into their own house. And that's why the wall is broken, the gates are burned, and even that word, place of worship is in ruin. But as God started to work, so Nehemiah, as a leader, they come together. Now you can see that Outwardly, the walls were rebuilt, but inwardly, their faith has been rebuilt. Their faith in God has been rebuilt. And God, how to rebuild their faith is how to take them, take them through a series of difficult events, right? They are, not, they are not just like a smooth sail. Oh, God is with us. Let's build. And then, bang, everything just like miracle happens. The wall raises up. Like the wall of Jericho fall down, God can easily raise up the walls of Jerusalem, right? But God takes them through a series of difficult events, the problems in their life. And those are problems they face in real life. The, the threats they're getting from enemy, the attacks, and all the other 
problems not only just externally from the enemy, but internally with themselves, right? We read through the previous chapters that where the rich or the, the, the priests and all those are, 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 are rich are actually taking advantage of those, their brethren that are poor, right? Taking their children, making them into slavery. So you can see that there's not only external problem, but there's internal problems, right? And sometimes we all know internal problem is difficult to solve than external problems, right? Because external problems, you can stand to get united to face them. But then when it's internal, inward fighting, what happened? You will just divide and conquer, broken down apart. But the great thing I want to kind of remind you of in all this, you keep hearing Nehemiah say, God, remember me of what I have done. But really, is Nehemiah remembering God? It was God remembering his people. In all this time, it was God that truly was with them and carrying them through this whole journey of rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem. And the last previous two, two chapters, we come to almost a climax because the wall is rebuilt, right? People are really excited because now see that the wall is rebuilt. It was impossible task, not we achieved it. But there was something even more important. God had drawn them back to the purpose of why he, the rebuilding of the wall of Jerusalem is for. It's for that returning to God in worship. And that's why in chapter 8 you see what they call the Watergate revival. Right? Ezra read from the word of God. Right? Not just one day or one session, but seven days. And they did something is extraordinary, right? There's something bigger than King David or King Solomon. Because King David, King Solomon never did it. But they did it. And that was the fierce of Tamanaku. It was from the time of Joshua that they had it. And then, it'll never happen. But you can see that the reading of the Word of God, the Bible, they discovered is something that's a secret that have never been discovered before. For all those years, even in the golden age of King David and King Solomon, they never saw that, discovered that in the Word of God. So dear brother and sister, when you read the Word of God, there's always treasure there for you. Right? There may be a lot of great men, right? A lot of great men that's already here, like you know, all the well-known preachers and uh, theologians and everything. They almost like, oh, they have exhausted all the truth in the word of God. Just wait. One day God can speak to you, and you may discover something that the great men of God have never saw before. And God can do that through his revelation to you. And we can see that also when it comes to chapter 9, that was great repentance. Now, this is hard, I can tell you. When you bring people to repentance, there's a lot of work need to do, but they never, never can achieve it without the reading of the Word of God. Because the Word of God that speaks to the heart and gives understanding to our heart to know what is right before God. And then comparing it with ourselves, we see, well, I'm actually foreshadowed what God's standard is. And that's where repentance comes, right? Because repentance is really a, a true expression that, now God, I don't think I met your standard, but I want to be there, okay? What I've been doing is missing the mark, but now I want to come to where you are. And that's where God provides grace. God's grace always helps us to know our sin, we feel guilty, that's a good sign. Because it means the next step is repentance. Repentance is almost an invitation. It's God's invitation. Right? When you accept God's invitation, it's through repentance. Because the Bible tells us if we confess our sins, God is faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. All right? So every time, if you're going through life, you feel that you have failure, you've done something wrong. For example, maybe small things like, I didn't read my Bible this morning. I got up too late. And I just had to rush out the door. 
And then now by lunchtime, I got convicted. Oh, I didn't read my Bible today, right? Don't worry. When you come home, just come to God. God, sorry I didn't read the Bible, but I'd like to read it now. Then just read it now. You see, God is, if God is working in your life, he's inviting you to come back to him. That's a way out for him. And we can see that when God starts to work in the hearts, that something extraordinary happens. And this with chapter 10. So that was just a bit of background. Um, so in chapter 10, we come into chapter 10, we're going to see into just quickly into three uh, portions. The first is the shield of consecration. Second is interference to consecration. And lastly is commitment to in- consecration. For the first point, now the first point is from starting from verse 1 and then going all the way to verse 27. And you may find it not easy to read because it's 84 names there. Uh, 84 names there, and then a lot of the, uh, the names, they do have meaning behind them, but I don't think most of us understand the meaning. But what we can see in summary is that there is Nehemiah, the governor, and then it goes through a list of names to say, these were the priests, and then it followed by the Levites, then their brethren, and then the leaders of the people. And then, finally, it concludes as now the rest of the people, those who have separated themselves from the peoples of the lands of the, the lands to the Lord of God, and everyone who had knowledge and understanding enter into a curse and an oath to walk in God's Lord. Now, I don't know when you read this chapter, do you actually discover something? That after that revival and that, const, that, that drawing of them back to God, they finally coming together from the leader. Nehemiah leads the, leads the, the names, the list of the names, all the way to the rest of the people. They all come stand united. And they were willing to put their name to shield to the covenant. It's like today having a big contract and then we all put our names like a petition or write our name or sign our names into it. That's not an easy task, isn't it? It's not an easy task. Because even like in a prayer meeting and you're asking now, now everybody has to pray. They go one by one, it's a difficult task to, to accomplish. But here is, they did it willingly. They were all willing to put their name to it, and what did they enter into? Enter into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law. Now that's a big, big challenge to them. It was not enter into a blessing and an oath for the, to walk in God's law. They were entered into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law. Now, that's tremendous. They were ready to face the consequence. Now, obviously, we know that God is merciful because in the last message, Brother Jeremy Shiva, he's a merciful God. And we see that through, in chapter 9, they almost give a recount of the whole history of Israel from the time they departed from Egypt. Now, you look at that long history it's a long history of failure after failure after failure, and the failure just gets, gets worse. It almost gets even more compacted together, you know, because by the time you go to judges, it's like failure up to the, you know, max, and then, well, there's a golden age of King David and, and you know, Solomon, and then more failure comes in both kingdoms that were just worth kings, one worse than the other, until they totally take contact captive. But in that long history of failure, God remains faithful. God never really forsaked them. And that's what that chapter 9 is really telling them. It's telling, all oh, this long period of failure, doesn't matter how deep they fall into the ditch, God ducked them out carry them out. God was always there in the lowest point of their life. 
they found God was there, never forsaken them. And how did they find, regain that faith? The reading of the Word of God. I once heard a preacher say, revival, and in some certain ethnic the dialect, it said revival, but it's a read Bible. So revival sounds like read Bible to them. And I think that's where the key is. If you're really finding yourself lacking of faith, do you know where the starting point is? It's always there, accessible to you. The Word of God. Read the Word of God and it will give you the faith. Because the Word of God will only draw you to God Himself. And that's what they found. And now, their heart is so prepared, they were willing to enter into a curse and an oath to walk in God's Lord. Even though it's a curse, an oath, to walk in God's law, but what we know is there's always mercy and blessing with God. Because God, from the day He created man, was not created man to destroy man. God was always created man so that man can be blessed and enjoy His presence. And after this point, God has not changed His purpose and will on purpose. God always wants to bring us out from where we are, our failure, into His blessing. And so what we learn from this section, I try to, uh, I try to kind of sum it up in, uh, in these two verses. Other place in the New Testament, uh, in John, and Jesus said, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. So we can see that what God is doing in the heart of the people of Israel was up to this point, He was drawing them back to Himself. So now what are they? They enter into a curse and an oath to walk in the Lord of God. God again become the center of their life. And also we can see in Psalm 110 and verse 3, it says, your people shall be volunteer or shall be willing in the day of your power, in the beauty of holiness. From the wounds of the morning, you have the jewel of you, your youth. Isn't that what we see? That is the day of God's power and the people was willing. Let's look at the second point. The interference to consecration. And what we see in the next section is what God opened their eyes to see. That for so long, something that they have been doing, which is interferes with a relationship with God or hinders, right? Or sabotage, if it would be a stronger word, that relationship with God. And what is what they hear, they, with their own mouth, they confess. They say, we would not give our daughters as wives to the peoples of the land, nor take their daughters for our sons. Because that was what they have been doing. Right? And then, you think that in chapter 10 here, they say they will stop doing it. Right? And is it a done deal? From now on, there'll be no, it's not going to happen again. Well, you just wait until you read chapter 13 that they were still doing the thing that they, would, they say they're going to stop doing. But doesn't God know it? Dear brother and sister, every time you make a mistake, every time you fail, is it to God a surprise? Whoa, I didn't know that Michael would do such a thing. No way. God knows it before it happens. Why? When you have stumbled, God has grace to catch you there. Right? Because again, the heart is not just one thing and it's perfect and pure. It's a continual progress. And I hope that this is what you will discover too. 
that God working in us is a continual progress. It's a progress. Where you are today does not mean that's reached the end of it. It's a continuing new work tomorrow, right? As, as you face different situations, different things in life, difficulty in life, you need to discover new ways of God working with you in that situation, right? Like for example, I'm going through the sickness of catching the fruit. Well, I need to have faith that while I'm sick, Christ is still in me. Now, isn't that thought a bit too kind of, uh, I think, Brother Michael, you may be just a bit too out there. Why will Christ be in you and you still be sick? Right? But the fact is that, yes, Christ is still in you. Right? By faith. We're in our spirit, in our heart. But I'm going through this physical pain and suffering, but I need to experience the grace God given to me to overcome this sickness. Right? I can either just let this happen I just like normal, and then I just go through it, and then seven days later, I'll get out of it. Or we can turn this into a relationship building with the Lord, right? There's a constant time where you can pray, you can reflect in your sickness, lying in bed, right? Aches and pains throughout the whole body, and yet you can pray and reflect on what's happening. And at the same time, he can claim God's grace and his healing to get better. And that's the same thing. You can see that the people, they know where their failure is. And they decide that they're going to stop doing that, right? So they're going to stop giving their daughters as wives to the people of the land and nor take their daughters for our sons. And second thing is, if the peoples of the land brought wares or any grain to sell on the Sabbath day, we would not buy it from them on the Sabbath or on a holy day. Sometimes you need to ask, when you read the Bible, why does God single this out, right? There's a lot of others, I'm sure that there's a lot of failure and problems that they have, or the wrong thing they have been done for these many, many years. But God in the book of Nehemiah, kind of writes it out, records it out. Because it's important. Important in the eyes of the Lord. It says what? The people of the land brought wares and any grain to sell on a Sabbath day. Selling it to who? To the Jews. To them. Because you see, things work like that. There's a supply and there's a demand. There's a demand, so there's a supply keep coming. And the, the heathen doesn't care about Sabbath day. They don't care about holy day. And what happened? You will let down your guards and you will continue to be like that, part of it. So what they see was something important because you remember, God rested on that day. Right? So Sabbath is, is really God's peace and rest that we entered into. Today on the Lord's day is not the Sabbath day. Right? In the olden days, the Sabbath day is yesterday, on the Saturday. But today is the day of resurrection. But we find peace on the day of resurrection. Right? We enter into God's rest. And the Sabbath was created for men. That's what Jesus said. Not men for the Sabbath. Right? So God specifically created a time of peace and rest for men to enter into. So that's why they saw that. Okay? And then lastly, it's like, and we would forego the seventh year's produce and the exacting of every debt. Now, why was they taking exile for 70 years? It was because one of these things that was recorded, right? They did not forego the seven year's produce and the exacting of every debt. They will continue farming the land on the seventh year when God said, we'll give it a year to rest. God was teaching them, right, to say, after being hard working six years, why don't you have the seventh year on God? I'll provide. You stop laboring and I'll provide. Isn't that wonderful? Right? Isn't that wonderful? If you know that that's what God's really inviting them to do, you've been hard working for six days, now let the seventh day enter into rest 
and let me supply. God will supply you for the seventh day. And now they recognize that. Okay? They come into the Lord and say, yes, we will. Right? For God, the seven years produce an exacting of every debt. So what do we learn? From the book of Vision, in chapter 4 and 20, 24, it says this, But you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. What God is speaking to us is that throughout our spiritual journey, our journey of faith with Christ for our life, in our lives, there will be a constant, right? Constant asking or decision making that putting off something so that you can put on something else. And this is what the Word of God is teaching us. Like, when do we come to that realization or that understanding? It's when we learn of Christ. From where? From the Word of God. As we read the Word of God, God's Word will instruct us what is right in the eye of God and what is not right in the sight of God. And that is where we came by grace, right? Because remember, every decision that you're making in life, you're not making it alone. Okay? You're making every decision with the Lord, with Jesus. So there is an understanding where you can put off what? Concerning your formal conduct, the old man which grow corrupt according to deceitful lust. What the children of Israel have been doing was because of their own lust, their own gain and no need, right? Is it the lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, right? Giving their daughter to the people of the land, taking their daughters, right? Buying all that, their goods, right? And also, you know, want to make big more, you know, income on the seventh year by not giving the land rest, right? All of this is from the, the lust, deceitful lust of themselves, but when it comes to here, say now, be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new man which is created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. And that's where the word of God will truly help you and help me. The word of God will come and help us, saying that there are things when we know that we need to be stopped doing and the things we need to stop putting on. Things we put off so we can put on. So every time when you're putting off something, don't think it's a negative. Rather, it's positive, very positive. Because what you're putting off is you're making room so that you can put on. Okay? It's like you're pouring things out that's taking space so that you can put better things to replace of it, in the place of it. Okay? And that's why you will look at all the attributes and characters that's in Christ are constructing or creating, God is forming in you and in me, right? So that we can grow up in stature like what Christ is. And God's constantly teaching us through our daily walk with Him, right? All these things, bring it in prayer before God and ask God, say, should I put it off? If I put it off, Lord, what shall I put it on? Right? There's always something better that God wants you to put on. That's why he revealed to you what you need to put off. Let's move on to the last part. Commitment to consecration. And when I read to this part of this chapter, you know, it's joyful because what they, what they are willing to do Right? So before we can do the three things they're going to say, we're going to stop doing, okay, and putting off. But then now it's like, this is what we're going to start doing. We are willing to do. 
So that's why we can see that the blessing multiplies. Because you can see the whole list. It's like we will to exact from ourselves yearly one third of the shackle for the service of the house of our God. And then they follow on for bringing the wood offering into the house of our God to bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all fruit of all trees year by year to the house of the Lord to bring the first for our sons, our cattle, and we will not neglect the house of our God. Did you recognize something repeating there? The house of our God, the house of our Lord. You can see that when they stop looking at their own needs or their own gains, they suddenly realize the needs in the house of God. Well, so, well, the house of God is lacking. Now, you can take this in a negative way. It's like, well, yeah, there's so much the house of God needs. How are we going to satisfy? How are we going to meet the needs of the house of God? You know, man, so we'll just give up, just like what we did in the past. We just give up, right? Nobody cares anymore, and then we're just going to care about our own house. But why is God revealing this to them? It's because of, because of what? Because God has restored the throne of God in their heart. Sometimes we pray, say, well, we want to give Christ the preeminence. I want to let God take charge of my, the throne of my heart. Right? But you can see here what God is showing. Nehemiah he is writing it down and saying, oh, look at the people, the change in their heart. They suddenly realize that how much blessing God has given to them. It was no longer saying that, well, how much gain I can get. Right? Oh, I give my daughter to marry that family in this land because they are a wealthy family and I'm married to that big family. I'm going to get a lot in return. Or looking at that, well, you know, if I buy it, they brought such good stuff, right, on the Sabbath day. If I buy it on that day and I sell next week, I'm going to make big profits. And they say, well, seventh year, well, I can't stop growing on seventh year. I will need to grow another crop and get another harvest, you know, and I'll be set for the next two days, two, two years. But the heart has changed. All the things that they think they're missing out, they suddenly realize God has been blessing them. And that's why you can see the whole list of how that they were willing to say, what? Yearly one third of shackle for the service of the house of God. Suddenly the people realize they have, they always think that they don't have, right? And that's why they need more. But now they suddenly realize they already had enough to give to the Lord. And you know in the Bible it tells the Lord is no debtor to anyone. God cannot be indebted to anyone, right? So if you think that you are giving too much to God and God's in debt to you, then you are wrong because God has given you back in multiplies, right? And that's why they say, well, and bring wood offering into the house of God. Now, if suddenly they see the richness that God has given to them. And the same thing to us today. And Till you're willing to worship and give to the Lord, you always feel that you are poor and lacking. But the moment you start to giving, and even in worship, in praise, you're finding that you are rich. God has already, for many years, have been putting a lot of things into your heart. The problem is you never let it out. You know? So here... We look at that, this is a kind of outward physical materials that they are bringing to the house of God. But today, what are we bringing to the house of God? The house of God is not this building. So we're not asking people, hey, can you bring some 
you know, glass to put on, bring some doors, bring some chairs, or bring some you know, utensils or something. We're not really asking people to say, you know, bring things to, to the church, like assembly. But what we are bringing to the house of God, the house of God is the body of Christ. It's the body that, what is it? Glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we come in here, it's through our worship, our praise, through our fellowship. What your spiritual learning, sharing with other brothers and sisters, spiritual learning. That is how you reach to the house of God. It's your spiritual riches. Right? We're not asking for you for material riches. Right? I don't know if you are surprised that here at this assembly, we you see nobody come and collecting money from you, offering from you. Whereas if you go to any other place, they always get a bag or a plate to collect offering from you. But here is all what? Out of free will offering. If you don't want to offer, that's fine. You don't have to. Right? But you feel that you're moved. Right? That you feel you're moved that you want to take a share in responsibility of providing a meeting place, however small part that you want to take, then you freely offer according to your ability. And God's delight in that. Just like the woman, the, the, the widow with the two mites, put into offering box and cries that she's done a great, tremendous work before God. More than all the other, all the, all the other you know, donations that all the rich people have put in there. And that's what God's looking at in your heart. Spiritual riches we bring into the house of God. Because the house of God is a spiritual building. It can only be, be filled in or be, be filled up when we bring our spiritual riches, all your learnings. You may through your reading of the Bible, through your prayer, through your fellowship, right? Through the life lessons that God has taught you in your life. When you bring all that together into the house of God and sharing and helping, supporting one another, that's how the house of God grows, the testimony grows. And the glory of Christ has been seen. And when people see us, they will know that we are his disciples. So, I want to conclude this with Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Dear brothers and sisters, this consecration is a continual process. It's a day-by-day, day, moment by moment. Right? It's allowing God to change our understanding of the mind. We know that there is a difference of, in the world and us, right? But the Holy Spirit is constantly using every moment in your life to teach you, to understand that. So that what happened? So that we may be renewed in our mind and know the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God has his will purpose in these last days. And are you ready to be with God by making yourself available? Well, that's what consecration really means. And the, 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 the title for this day is making yourself available to God to be filled by him. Consecration is not about just bring things to God. God's got everything. It's all sufficient. He doesn't need anything for you to bring anything to him. But rather, he wants to fill you. So if you come empty-handed, God will fill you. And the same way, when we offer ourselves to God, say, God, fill me. Right? One day people ask me a question, say, well, what is a Christian life? Well, what is living a Christian life? Right? And I give an answer, say, well, you live a life with Christ in you in every part of your life. 
right? Whatever you do, wherever you go, every moment of your life, can Christ be in there? Right? Can we actually identify Christ? If your whole life was like, you know, like a film that is spread it out, can we identify Christ in every picture of your life? Doesn't matter where you are, whether you're in sicknesses, whether you're in happiness, whether you're at home, whether you're at work, whatever you're doing, shopping, you're driving, right? You're, you're on the airplane, or wherever you go, can, is Christ there? Are you consciously knowing that Christ is there with you and in you? Right? That you can always talk to Him and asking Him and let Him lead and guide you in that moment. That is a Christian life. Live a life with Christ in every part of your life. That's a Christian life. So we will conclude with this. It's like in John 17, Jesus' last prayer before he was crucified. And he said, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. Just as I am not of the world, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Brother, sister, there is a difference between us and what's in the world. What is separating you and me from the world? In Nehemiah's day, they built a physical wall to separate them from the people outside and the people inside. People that's inside belongs to God, right? They live a life centered in God. Worship. But what about today? Should we be building or constructing a spiritual war in our life, in our walk? Do you know what separates you from the world? Why are you different to the world? It's a fact. Jesus said, we are in the world, but we are not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth, your worthy truth. Read your Bible, brother and sister. Read your Bibles. God can speak to your hearts. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do come to give thanks to you, Lord. We really rejoice that your word is always refreshing to us. As we come to share your word, read your word, and meditate on your word, it always brings light, brings comfort, and brings peace to our heart. I really pray, dear Lord, that truly you, Lord, use your word to sanctify us, to help us to build up that testimony of separation. So though we today live in this world, but we do not belong to the world. We belong to heaven. We belong to you, Lord. And we really pray that, dear Lord, that in every part of our life, that you can be dead. In our decision, every choice and every corner turns that we make, that you are there with us. And we want to thank you, Lord, that we, our life may be full of failures, but yet you are faithful. No matter how deep we fall into, you are always there to catch us. So we pray, dear Lord, that today you'll comfort our hearts where we need comforting. Lord, where our faith are lacking, that you may restore our faith by looking to you. And Lord, where we have sickness, that you may restore our health. Lord, we want to thank you because you are a true and living God. And we come to put our whole trust in you. In Jesus' precious name. Amen.